Oh, we've um, started the webinar. I'm just uh, trying to see who we've got on here today. Uh, so we've got a really fantastic webinar organised. Uh, we may just may wait a few more minutes for a few more people to come in. Uh, we've got a, a few here. Um, I'm expecting a few more, so we might just wait a couple of minutes. So just um, get your pen and paper ready. Maybe get a drink of water and uh, we'll see how we go. Yep, I'm getting a few more in now. So maybe we'll wait till maybe three minutes past or yep. five minutes okay. past and we'll see how, we, how we're tracking. Okay. So I guess while we while we wait, um, I'll introduce myself in a little while. But I, I did want to just um, make sure that everyone is aware that there's also a follow up webinar that we've got coming up on the twenty fourth. Uh, which is Wednesday week. Uh, that one's focusing more on the Tower Point Nature Reserve, and that's going to be up on the local land services uh, Facebook page. Um, I'm trying to get it out on Wednesday, so that we're about a week before. And um, again, I'd, I'd love if people could share that so we can get lots and lots of people on. Uh, it'll be focusing on Tower Point and um, specifically looking at the uh, Little Turn, the Pied Oyster Catcher, and the Eastern Curlew. So they're, you know, uh, various birds that use Tower Point. To different in different ways, um, some for breeding, some for roosting, some some for feeding, and uh, so Phil will be talking about that on on Wednesday the twenty fourth. So it's going to be a that's going to be a cracker. I'm really looking forward to that one uh, because if you've come to this one and you're going to the next one, you're you're really getting a big focus on four really amazing birds that um, that are in this area. So um, it's well worth uh, registering for that. So I think we're we're doing pretty well here. We've got 17, I think. So I'm expecting a few more people to come in, but I, I do think though, if, if it's um, four minutes past five, I think we can actually get started. If everyone's happy for me to proceed. Uh, yeah, so um, just to introduce myself, my name's Liz Bully and I'm a, a Senior Land Services Officer for Greater Sydney Local Land Services. Uh, as part of the National Land Care Program and the Tower Point uh, funding that we get from the federal government, we've been able to, to uh, bring you these uh, free webinars and we've managed to get a real expert in this area, which is Phil Straw. Uh, you might be able to see him on the screen there. And um, he's going to be presenting today on, um, so he's going to be covering the East Asian Australasian Flyway. So if, if you haven't heard of that, you're about to learn, go into a great deep dive on that. It's really fascinating. I've, I've looked through the presentation. I think you're all going to really enjoy it. Uh, but what I'll do first is I'll just do a very quick um, uh, welcome to country. So I'll begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today. And, and because of the nature of webinars, uh, everybody's meeting on different parts of country. Uh, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. So you're quite welcome to put in the chat uh, whereabouts you're um, logging in from today, because that's always really interesting to see how far and wide uh, the audience is coming from. Uh, so as I said, we're having uh, the first of two webinars. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about the second one again at the end in case anyone missed my little blurb on it. Um, so uh, I'll just do a very brief biography uh, covering Phil's experience. He sent me some information. It's it's all very impressive and I felt bad having to cull it down and bring it down to something I could read in a couple of minutes because there's quite a lot of information there. <laughs> Uh, so I guess uh, to start off with, Phil's involvement with uh, wetland management and migratory birds started in 1960, uh, where he worked for Dr. Luke Hoffman, who's pretty much seen as the founding father of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. Uh, that was in the Camargue in the south of France. Uh, he was, Phil was also involved in the MAR conference in 1962, which is um, where they called for an international convention on wetlands, following concern with how rapidly large areas of wetlands in Europe were being uh, impacted. So this led to the birth of Ramsar. Uh, Phil left France to work at the Edward Gray Institute of Field Ornithology in Oxford and then he soon travelled to Australia where he worked for the Department of Zoology at Queensland University. 
for five years, then the Research Department of New South Wales Fisheries, followed by the New South Wales Parks and Wildlife Service. So that's a pretty varied um, experience there in Australia. Uh, in 1992, he formed his own company, which looked at uh, working in the design, construction and management of wetlands, both in Australia and also in Asia. In 96, he convened a symposium, which led to the launch of the East Asian Australasian Shorebird Reserve Network, and subsequently eight countries recognising there were 19 wetland sites that were critical to the survival of these migratory species. Phil is the Australasian Way to Study Group's East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership Liaison Officer and is now working for the with the CEPA Working Group of the EAAFP, including the subject of this presentation today. So I think you can see we've got good pedigree here to be uh, passing on the information about this topic. Uh, so without any further delay, I'd like to pass over to Phil Straw and. Um, and get him to go through uh, this uh, series of slides. I'll be actually helping Phil by just going through them myself. And um, yes, I'll hand over to Phil now. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Liz. Great to be here talking about my favourite subject. <laughs> okay. Um, well, there's the title page for here, which is uh, very nice. Um, perhaps the first slide, um, Liz. Um, okay, we're talking about shorebirds. Um, <clears throat> of the shorebirds in Australia, 18 are resident species, which we won't talk about today, and 36 are migrants. And there's the pictures of um, the Bata Godwit. Next slide. And these are all shorebirds. Uh, Broadbill Sunpipe at the top left, little uh, red neck stint in the middle at the top and uh, red knot top right and then you've got eastern curlew and in the middle of the plovers that's one bird that comes here during our winter not during our summer all the rest come here during our summer and that one comes from new zealand that's a double banded plover but they they lay them snipe um and, and, and on the right middle and then the pratting coal which is a bit of a an oddball one it uh, goes on to coastal wetlands and often goes out onto the uh, tidal flats in northwest Australia. And there's been counted up to nearly 2.1 million birds in one season. So uh, it's very erratic though. And then the bottom of Godwit again at the bottom. Next slide, please. Okay, the shorebirds, uh, unlike songbirds, they, they work differently. The shorebirds may feed day and night and feed according to the tide. Um, low tide increases the area of feeding and, uh, and the behaviour of prey and that's when they feed most of the time, whether it's day or night. Smaller birds tend to need to feed a bit longer because uh, smaller birds don't eat so much, uh, large amounts. And at high tide birds roost at various roost sites. Now this varies during the day and night. You'll see them on sand spits and many other places and beaches and things um, but during the day, but you will not see them there at night. They sh shift across to flooded salt marsh, shallow water and places like that so they can see predators approaching them at night. So they're totally different behaviour day and night. Next slide. Okay, My, most migratory shorebirds spend most of their lives on intertidal mudflats. And that's a globally declining resource um, because um, they're with us for about seven to eight, six or seven months of the year, feeding on mudflats in Australia. And they then move for uh, migration to the breeding grounds. Next slide, the list. And what do they eat? Okay, you've got polychaete worms, uh, bivalves, and a little um, crustaceans, amphipods. The, um, with the bivalves, um, the red knot typically will swallow one of those. And if it's a very quiet environment, or a lab where they're doing experiments, you'll hear a crunch after about 30 seconds as the gut actually crushes the shell and then they digest the food. Next slide. Okay, let's go into the bivalve Godwit. It's a very adaptable in use of estuarine and coastal feeding habitats in and around Australia taking prey from rather uh, firm sandy substrate flats as well as next slide and deep into soft mud 
the birds detect prey with their tips of their bills. They're very sensitive. So even though the Godric not using its eyes, obviously under under the mud there, but he's uh, locating prey and then they'll pull that up to eat. And just a picture of the bird in flight and preening its feathers after uh, mugging around in the mud. Uh, next one, Liz. Okay, now this bird uh, in a fat load, we've, we've measured the amount of fat on a bird and a scale of one to five, this is five. That is, um, he must be about ready to go. To be able to make a non-stop flight of a week or more, a bird has to put on enough fat, which acts as fuel to carry the bird at altitudes of 3,000 to 5,000 meters in varying weather conditions, plus obviously some in, in, in fat in reserve. Next slide. Okay, now these are flying machines. Uh, almost like um, jet fighters in shape. Um, they're fat from the neck down to the um, base of the tail, indicates they are ready to commence their first 10,000 kilometers flight from, from uh, Sydney or wherever they're leaving from to the Yellow Sea region between Korea and China. Next one's Liz. Okay. Now, pre-migration, birds fatten up, as I said before, with 55 to 85% increased weight. Now, if you put it on your weight that much, you'd find it very difficult to walk, wouldn't you? Uh, this is to uh, fuel their flight. They don't normally go that fat because they need to be agile and keep away from predators. But once they get up in migration, they're above um, those sort of uh, areas where they're going to get to bump into uh, falcons and things so you can afford to uh, just take off and uh, fly in the direction in this in single direction there um now the pre migration also means that they have to float mus flight muscles have to be built up to carry the load the blood thickens with an enlarged heart enables oxygen supply to more muscles Decrease in size of the feeding organisms once they take off. They're not going to be feeding for a week or so. And then uh, that's including the stomach, intestines, liver and kidneys. And decrease, decrease in flight uh, non-essential muscles, ma muscle mass. Um, and before they leave, as you saw by the fat bird there, complete their molt before their breathing plumage before they go because the fittest of individuals complete the, the, um, this before departures, thus ensuring a greater breeding success. Next slide. Okay, during flight. Now these things are all happening during that uh, long flight, whether it's uh, the first one to China or the onwards to Korea and also coming back. They decrease in weight. Um, due to the energy consumption, using up to a gram of fat per hour, so they're losing weight. Um, the atrophy of the flight muscles as decreases in weight makes them redundant. Heart muscles atrophies as muscles decrease, the, the engine virtually shrinks with the cars, as they say. And brain chemistry changes to allow non-stop flight for days at a time. Evidence suggests that they may be able to rest sections of their brain independently as they're flying. Next slide. Okay, so we're off now on our first. No, we'll go back one. From Australia, from uh, from uh, Sydney or wherever, directly to between Korea and China, that's where the line finishes up in the Yellow Sea. And this is the first stage of the Sydney to Alaska flight via the north end of the Yellow Sea, that's between Korea and China. A non-stop flight of 10,000 kilometers, taking up to eight days on that first flight. So they've used a lot of energy up on that trip. 
Next slide. And that's just to show uh, different species there. The Godwit, so the brown lines along the north coasts. Then you've got um, uh, Terex sandpipers and uh, eastern curlers that don't quite go up that far. And then it shows the trip back. So this is a bit out of date now. We've got um, well, we've got over eleven thousand kilometres in one flight. Uh, there have been twelve. Yeah, the, the the last one was up to about thirteen thousand kilometres. So um, um, that's about the limit we think so from uh, alaska to australia uh, and new zealand return trip is 34,000 kilometers approximately part out godwitz um 310 grams non migratory weight that's without the fat load and um 11,000 kilometers or a lot more uh, the flight south, first ever flight for a young bird is um, quite a, um, a, cheap, a, um, um, a feat. Uh, next one, Liz. Okay, I can relax a bit more now. We Okay, on the north of the migration, shorebirds flying to the east, Asian, that's pleasant fly, we will stop off for five to six weeks in the Yellow Sea region of China or Korea to refuel and prepare for the breeding grounds. Now they've used up nearly all the fat getting from Sydney to the Yellow Sea. As you can see, the tidal flats here are huge. Very, it, goes, it goes off to the in the horizon. Very productive feeding areas. And the five or six weeks then is to put them a, a, a big a full load on again because their next flight is going to be to Alaska, to the breeding grounds. Next slide. Where, uh, well, okay, well, uh, where there is um, very little food available for the adults when they get there. Now, although the tidal flights are very extensive, there are threats to shorebirds in China, including fishing nets. Uh, fortunately, a lot of fishing nets are fairly easy to see. Um, but we have to watch fishermen these days because they don't like shorebirds competing with them. And some of them use the very fine nets, almost like mist nets. So we have to tighten up the laws relating to fishermen in, in China because um, we don't want them being caught up in a fishing net, uh, fishing nets like a mist net and uh, be killed during the process. The little um, odd structure in the middle of the screen there is a, um, a dwelling that. Um, goes up and down on the tide, this little raft with a little house on it. And that's where fishermen spend their time uh, between tides uh, during the day, uh, rather than going home and back again, which is quite a slog across uh, such big mud flats, not just as that. But you see that the, the nets go uh, as far as you can see. Next slide. Now the other ones, uh, these are people who are collecting shellfish as often do in Sydney and or, or in Australia, many places for food. And um, provided these people are just collecting using their little um, dredge, dredges and pick them up, they're, um, the, the, the harvesting is, is pretty sustainable. It's um, just that some people tend to do these days use little pumps and that to speed things up. And that um, is not so susceptible. So, so, um, um sustainable um so there's obviously um, competition for the shrinking resource there next slide and um a third threat to um shorebirds generally um, in, in on the coast of china and korea is industrial pollution and i'll touch on that a bit later on um because it's uh, not doing the, the feeding habitat much good and all the food that they eat next slide okay land reformation for fish ponds is one of the um threats in a, in a way um it could be fish ponds or rice fields and eventually development you can see the, the uh, habitat is 
quite extensive there where they've been reclaimed. If it's fish ponds, there is often a, fair, a reasonable amount of food for the birds feeding in the fish ponds and it can feed in the ponds and roost on the banks. So the fish ponds are, are not too bad at all. And not so much rice paddies or birds who feed in rice paddies during the flooded period. And next slide. Okay, the top right hand, you can see to the extent of those tidal flats you saw before. Um, just uh, fish ponds and uh, um, other types of um, and, uh, marine um, harvesting. It could be salt pans and things like that as well. And um, research is being carried out. This is a young lady from Beijing Normal University helping out with the surveys up there. Um, these are essential, but can we make a difference as to seeing? Okay, next slide. Uh, this. Okay, now one of the biggest threats in China and Korea, as well as Australia, is land reclamation. Um, you'll hear, I won't go into those details in Australia, it takes us too long. <laughs> and um, But uh, obviously this is going to be a loss of uh, uh, feeding area. And this is how the sites are reclaimed uh, uh, on the previous slides. Next slide. Okay, this is one of the biggest disasters for shorebirds, a place called Simangong. You'll see a, a sea wall which goes about 33 kilometers, uh, closing off what was on the right hand side, tidal flats. You can still see the faint areas of the shoals. And um, they wanted to, originally wanted to drain this for agriculture. But as you can see by the small image there, that was actually used for uh, development and those areas have been uh, built on. And um, so the, the the whole area has been lost, the feeding area, so the biggest loss of um, feeding habitat of any one site in, in the whole flyway of the world. Um, so you've got a little bit of tidal flats, but they, they, they will eventually be taken up as well. Um, so that's um, huge barrages there to keep the, the water from those rivers coming from the right, flowing straight out into the uh, sea and uh, well, they, they then reclaim as the little image shows there. Next um, one, uh, Liz. Now, this is an interesting uh, shot. Um, these are a picture of a couple of um, hunters of a father and son team. And this is how they would normally catch shorebirds for the market. The birds have to be caught in a good condition. You see the guys are extracting it from a, a, what we call a clap net. And you'll see the birds apparently near them, near the bird, the guy standing in the water, but they're not, they're actually decoys. And they have these decoys and then they have a clap net folded up under the, under the mud. And as the birds come down to investigate, they pull a string and the clap net whizzes over the top of them. And then they catch the birds and extract them from the net as he is doing there. Now you'll see next to him, he's got a nice big basket uh, and which he puts the shorebirds in those. They can't fly out, so, but they can uh, move around so they're quite um, unharmed. And then in the top corner there, they're walking back to um, shore. In our case, they were moving across to the banding station because these guys were also used by the Fudan University uh, in Shanghai for catching birds for banding. Because these are the experts, they catch a lot more birds than we can with cannon nets. And the, the other good thing is they come across with baskets full at a time, not you know, a huge net full of a time, and we're banding at the rate at which they're bringing them in. And the bottom, you can see there, we're, that's the banding station where we're actually banding the birds. And uh, some of those color mark birds will up now see as Australia as they come across. So um, these are the good guys, and with their expertise enables this, 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 this sort of work. So these guys um, uh, are, are being helping us out. They initially, uh, we initially asked them how, how much they asked how much they're going to pay per kilo 
<laughs> and we said, no, we won't pay by birds because we we're abandoning them. Anyway, we didn't pay them a lot of money, but it's, it's very handy having them do this. It helped our research a lot. Next slide. Right, now when we're doing surveys of tidal flats, these are some of the, the bands between different fish ponds and things. It's a very narrow stretch. We use a hire a little van with a local driver. And this is one of the guys from Beijing watching that he doesn't drive up the edge. And um, we cover huge areas like this, which is uh, quite painstaking and uh, a bit of a challenge. But uh, anyway, um, next one. Now, this is a, a place called Yellow Jane, which is a big nature reserve now. It doesn't look like a nature reserve. Uh, but um, you can catch uh, fish ponds as nature reserves as well. And these are those are roosts of birds. You see the mass of birds on that um, lower uh, bund wall and little um, fence along the edge of it there. And that's thousands and thousands of birds can roost on those there and even feed in the ponds or f fly between those banks and the intertidal shores. So this provides an excellent um, uh, stopover site for migratory shorebirds. So it's one um, a benefit for for these um, sites. Next one, Liz. Okay, now the birds have fattened up after that uh, time in the um, the yellow sea, up to their full capacity, because these birds are now flying across to Alaska, and they, they, these birds, once they arrive there, these are the adults, don't really have any food there. The whole idea is for laying eggs at the right time of year for the chicks to rear. So they've got to arrive, the females, to lay eggs. That's why they need to be really fat before they leave, because they use most of the resources, fat reserves up in laying eggs and the males establishing territories and such like. Next slide. And this is the tundra in, in Alaska. It's a big uh, sort of wet, boggy sort of area um, with uh, you know, lots of um, sort of pools and such like for the birds to feed. And, uh, and you'll see by the next slide uh, that, um, next slide, Liz. Uh, this is the, um, the tundra, it's a very boggy area. And that's as high as the vegetation grows in the tundra there. And that's including the little trees and grasses and such like. And um, the birds um, can feed to some extent in the uh, in the lagoons there. But as we go on to the next slide, um, there's a few little berries and that. Not many shorebirds eat the berries. Some species do. Um, but at that time, that's about all there is on that uh, on the tidal flat there. Um, and the next slide. This is a godwit on the breeding grounds, a male. This is pretty well camouflaged. Also, the tundra is pretty flat there. They can see any approach of any predators, which is what they feel happy with. They can be sitting down, camouflage themselves, and they can watch out to, uh, for predators um, that might attach, which I'll show you in a, in a short while. Next slide. And this is the female nestled down into the tundra near a beak there. That's a, um, a willow tree of the <laughs> about the height that grows willow trees in, in Alaska and other little shrubs and things growing around her. And she fits in quite well there. Next slide. Now, this is what it's all about. This is a friend of mine, Elena Alapo. Dr. Alapo, she uh, works for the uh, uh, Academy of Sciences in, uh, Moscow and um, the timing of the hatchlings of, of uh, chicks coincide with the hatching of billions of insects during the tw uh, short but 24 hour daylight summer. Now the chicks are not fed by the adults. Even if you see a mass lapwing walking in your park, you'll see the chicks are not being fed. They go around feeding themselves, picking on the ground. So these birds have to better feed themselves and they come out and they've got these insects coming out of the, the vegetation there. All they do is just walk around and eat. 
um, well the, in the, during the time there until they reach full size and are able to fly. Uh, by which time the females have already left because they've already used the, most of their reserves up and they left. the males are left to look after their chicks. Next slide. Uh, one of the big issues there is um, predators, the Arctic fox. This is not a, a shorebird egg, it's a goose egg. And um, but um, so predation is one thing they have to watch out for, and um, as birds do anywhere in the world, I suppose. And the adults uh, are the ones that draw predators away from the chicks and uh, help them protect them that way. And the next slide is another predator. Is the long-tailed skewer. They also will take chicks and eggs, small chicks and eggs, um, and they're quite plentiful as well. They also get um, snowy owls and a few other birds of prey up there as well. Okay, the next slide, uh, Liz. Now, you've all heard about lemmings, and we have lemming years, There's sort of uh, myths about them running off cliffs and things like that, and the numbers. But uh, anyway, the good lemming year. The predation pressure on shorebirds is much lower, resulting in a higher survival rate. So it's a good shorebird year when you've got a good lemming year. Okay, the next slide. Okay, so as I said, the females at this stage have already gone back. The males now move down to the intertidal flats of Alaska, where the birds, the young birds, switch feeding from the tundra habitat to the habitat they'll be using for the rest of their lives, and that's intertidal mudflats. And that's a different type of food. And here they must fatten up, and the, the mudflats there are very um, productive. And um, the males will leave shortly after this, as soon as they've got enough fat on, and leave the young to fatten up themselves. And um, eventually, the young uh, that have been deserted by the adults will follow on and start flying across the world's biggest ocean, the Pacific Ocean, to an unknown destination. That's an instinct that's built into all migratory birds, is a direction to fly, but uh, not knowing where they're going. <laughs> um, so, uh, next slide. This is the distance they fly. Young birds haven't flown there before. The adults have already gone. And this is 11,000 or now up to 13,000 per kilometer per flight that we know in nine days. Now it's nine days without stops on the way. You're flapping your wings continuously for that period of time. And the birds don't know it, but eventually they will hit land if they keep flying far enough. The adults, once they get there, already know they the, uh, from the landscape where they're going, and they always go back to the beach that they used in previous years. The young birds don't know, they just uh, land on the coast and um, match up with any other shorebirds feeding on the intertidal mudflats and, um, uh, until it's, it's time for them to uh, do them for the return migration. Okay, the next slide. And that flight is about the limits of endurance of shorebirds. The young birds obviously uh, suffer more than adults. The three birds in the front, the one with its wings up and the one behind it in front of are young birds. And the, you see the one st struggling to stand up, the tide's just coming in a little bit there and it's getting a bit wet. So it's trying to stand up there, you can see it. It's actually at the limits of endur endurance. Because once they land, they have to switch back to feeding mode after that migration and then start feeding as soon as they can after that to uh, just enough flight um, body weight to fly around because they won't need to put on fat load until they return. But the survival of the um, birds in, um, is, is high with the birds having completed these um, epic journeys over there lifespan that is of 20 to 30 years, adults back and forth all that time, they travel a huge amount of distance during their life, just doing migration. And at the end of each migration, most birds have 
depleted all of their reserves, juveniles, as I said before, um, particularly uh, find it very, very hard. And some of them, of course, don't make it. Next slide. Right. Now, is it safe back to Australia when they get back? Well, not really. Uh, loss of habitat and disturbance are serious threats to shorebirds, shorebirds in Australia. If shorebirds cannot put on enough fat for the journey at the end of the, uh, uh, the, the time in Australia when they fly back to the breeding grounds, in fact, they don't, there's no migration and therefore no recruit. So um, that means that uh, the population may, may decline if it gets too bad. <coughs> Um, birds are disturbed at their, their feeding areas, chased by dogs, kept away from the feeding and roost sites by jet skis, kite surfing, etc. And sites of international importance for motor shorebirds around Australia are responsibility and management by state conservation agencies, whereas in big a lot of countries, are, the NGOs are pretty big and they often do management of sites, but in Australia, it's just the governments. The site managers of the uh, about uh, 200 sites of, in Australia may know little about migratory shorebirds. Now, as a part of work that I am, um, part of uh, working groups I, I'm working with, uh, with uh, those colleagues in the East Asian Flyaway, um, to establish uh, a, a, a waterbird site manager network, that is uh, training people up, providing uh, training materials and such like, just try to improve the uh, management of sites in Australia. And that is not just in Australia, but throughout the flyway, because a lot of birds um, um, go to quite uh, all, the, all, all of the other countries between the Arctic and, uh, and Australia, and some of them don't come across this far south, but stay up there in those countries. Uh, and Australia's biggest challenge will be, let's say, uh, run, um, uh, to, to um, uh, sorry, their biggest challenge will also be to run the site manager training program, which I just mentioned. Next one. Okay. We don't see so much uh, drastic uh, and uh, obvious dumping of rubbish on wetlands these days. People realise they're not wastelands. But um, just down below, you see a fisherman quite innocently, innocently, innocently nesting off a beach or a sand spit, and not knowing that that normally at high tide is an important roost site until it's explained to him and he might move on. But the other one is. Um, Dogs, dogs um, chase birds. Some people say, oh, well, they're only chasing seagulls and not doing any real damage. But every time the bird dog chases the birds, they're using up reserves of the fat that they might be uh, putting on towards the time to go down migration. And um, this may affect their um, their ability to, to migrate. So we, we have to make people aware of all these uh, uh, disturbances. And um, it happens in a lot of places. Local councils don't always stop people from letting dogs run off leash and that's one big issue that we're fighting in the moment. Next slide. Okay, this is Botany Bay. In 1942, the north side of Botany Bay was an incredible place for um, shorebirds. The early ornithologists used to do a lot of work there, counting thousands of micro shorebirds. And um, that was the main area and south side, not so much, but you'll see that now the south side's all that's left. But anyway, um, although wetlands have been reclaimed for Sydney Airport, extensive tidal flats still stretch across much of the northern shores of the bay, several, several thousand shorebirds counting. You can just see uh, where the river, Cook's River, there's a snake. There's a very faint cross there, which is what was an, a an airport in 1942 and uh, nothing compared with what we get these days and the next slide shows a line across virtually what we're just looking at since then we have port botany 
in the top right. The extension of the uh, airport, the Cooks River that came out at the top there, uh, just um, like two dark lines um, coming down to the, 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 uh, where the old Cooks River used to come out, has been diverted and now comes out uh, on the left there, retained by rock walls and such like, so it doesn't provide an estuary at all. And um, we had the power of the main runway, which is the fat one, a short one there, and there was in the 1960s. And in 1992, they de started developing the parallel runway, which is the long finger there. So there's lots of practical wetlands on the northern shores. Uh, some species have all but disappeared from the area. Next slide. Okay, this is just to give you a quick vision of what we've gone through. And um, the flight pattern of E7, a very famous fem uh, female of Godwit, who had a satellite tracker and followed the whole route from Australia to China to Alaska and back down again to New Zealand in this case. So, um, and that one was uh, about 13 and a half thousand kilometers in 11 days from Alaska. And um, this is a record. Um, next slide. Okay, we're getting towards the end now. Um, there's some good news for this. Is the world's largest World Heritage Society. It happens to be the, the tidal flats in China and Korea I was showing you before. Um, when uh, Xi Jinping, the current president of China, got into uh, power, he realized that a lot of illegal de de coastal development was taking place and he a red line down the coast and said any development on here that's uh, not uh, approved and not built on will be confiscated and the sites protected and there's just a huge area of tidal flats you know, the biggest tidal flats in the world so it's a very important what we call the yellow sea area for most shorebirds and until this period uh, they were being lost at a high rate as you saw from the previous slides and the next slide and this is the celebration of the um, de declaration of the World Heritage Site of the Bovai Bay is one particular, that was the area we just looked at, which is uh, one of the most important place for Mike Shorbers in the world. And I think that might be the end. Just have a look next slide. Yeah. All right, well, that's the story in a nutshell. So Liz, uh, you're going to, are you um, getting any questions or do you want to take the questions? Yeah, um, I'm just having a little look. Has anyone put any, I'm just wondering if there are um, some questions. We did put down um, if anyone has any anything from, they want to know a little bit more information on something that um, you want to expand it on. Um, I, I'm hoping a couple of questions do come up there, but um, yeah, I find that amazing that you can Go thirteen and a half thousand kilometres in eleven days. That's just, yeah. you know, I, I do a four-hour drive and I'm exhausted, and it's the car doing all the work. But <laughs> I just find it incredible that these birds can travel like they do. And this is not not stopping. You can't glide. You're not gliding like a lot of the birds do. You're actually flapping the wings for that length of time. So it's a bit mm. of an endurance, to say the least. <laughs> so I'm assuming this sleep. I've heard. Some people say that when birds are migrating, they're sleeping on the wing. Yeah, are these birds doing that? Well, they reckon that they can rest certain parts of the brain. Probably in the text that we should probably pick up. Um, so they are, uh, in a way, they are resting their brain as they're um, as they're migrating over that period of time. Um, mm. but, um, yeah, it's feats. A lot more research has to be done really on migration, how they navigate, and everything else. Um, I mean, a young bird that flies across the Pacific, something it's never done before, and keep flying, flying and flying and flying until they hit land at the other end, which of course I was completely unaware of. Or well, the adults have been doing it for a long time, of course. Mm. Uh, yeah, and it's amazing they know which direction to fly in when they've never done it before. <laughs> I find that amazing as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. well, um, I think we did have, I did have one question early on. Um, I've just got it on my phone. I'll just be a moment. Um, someone was mentioning 
asking about data available about bird flights in the wind farm zone of the Illawarra. I guess that's that's probably a bit of a. Um, oh, you're talking about the um, turbines. Yes, wind, wind turbines. Oh, right. um, well, uh, wind farms. You've, you've got to worry about wind farms depending on what height the birds are flying. Now, shorebirds, once they're here, they're flying from place to place, they're flying pretty low across the border and from site to site. Um, and when they're migrating, although they don't go to that, that height, usually over um, into tidal areas, they fly at three, three to 5,000 metres, which is above that height. A lot of birds that do have a problems are raptors, birds of prey, not so much over the water. Mm -hmm which are very slow flying and um, they're often looking down rather than looking ahead. And in Tasmania, there's a big threat to um, the Tasmanian um, uh, Wedgestead eagle, eagle, which is uh, protected. And um, there's some court cases to have been taken up against uh, the authorities uh, with wind, wind farms there. And uh, in other parts of the world, um, um, cranes and storks are a threat, uh, are threatened by wind farms because they fly at the wrong altitude across the Mediterranean or, or, the, or the stretches of water. But um, uh, there's not a lot of work being done here. You, you do see a lot of birds hit power lines, which have always been there, which again they don't notice as they're flying around looking down to the ground. Um, but um, I'm not sure about wind farms. There's no real research done here. We must follow up what a lot of the uh, BirdLife International have been doing uh, in uh, in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, they've done a lot well, more research. That's that's a bit of a segue just there. Um, bef before everyone logs off, um, as the webinar finishes, there's a little survey I've just put. It's literally three questions. Um, and one of them is the, the important one. It's a short answer question. So um, Greater Sydney Local Land Services is reapplying for five years more funding from the federal government for the Ramsar uh, wetland and various other projects. But um, as I'm managing the Ramsar project, I'm looking for anybody to come up with any ideas they've got, any holes that they see where they want more information, they want more work done in certain areas to do with Tara. Uh, in particular, but also just migratory birds. Um, so I'd be really interested if you can fill out that survey and give me, even if we're going to do some more webinars, what birds you're interested in hearing about, that sort of thing. So any species, any issues, that sort of thing. Uh, so I'd really be grateful. And anyone who's interested in uh, registering for the second webinar, I'd love people to come. It's gonna be really, really fantastic. It just fleshes out those four four really iconic birds um, that, that I associate with Tara so that you can really understand uh, everything you, you want to know about them. So it's a really good way to, to sort of uh, flesh out your, your experience there. Uh, so I guess if there's no more questions, I know there was, um, no, I haven't got any other questions there. So um, I, I just, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming. It's It's been really informative and, and of course, thank Phil uh, for uh, presenting today. I've, I've got a lot out of it. I hope you have as well. Uh, and I've also um, got a recording of the presentation. So um, if anyone wants a copy of that, I do believe I've got that set to go out in uh, an email tomorrow, um, which also will have the survey uh, included in that. So um, yeah, I just um, really want to thank everyone for making it a really great event. And um, hopefully we'll see you on the 24th. So that's five o'clock as well. And uh, again, more focusing on Tower and the iconic birds of Tower Point. So um, I guess we can, we can uh, wrap up there and uh, thank everyone for attending. And thank you, Phil. Thanks, Liz. Pleasure. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tim.